Um, with those two things in mind, you can start considering which are the right technologies to leverage. Um, so if, if, for instance, you have a mobile application versus a web application or an API or a platform as a service kind of thing, um, the technologies that you're using are going to be vastly different not just on the kind of enabling technologies, but also on the AI portion itself. Um, you have mobile optimized deep learning networks, um, you know, models with, with lower um, file sizes for downloading the weights and things like this. So um, yeah, based on those first two factors, you wanna be selecting the, the appropriate technology. Now these are all relatively technical or product facing considerations, um, but on the organizational level, it's also really key and, and we see a number of institutions kind of um, glossing over these these last three pieces um, that are more institutional. So making sure that you know not only have you identified the right technology and, and data and problems to solve, uh, but you have the capacity and talent as an organization in order to piece those together to take those ingredients and, and bake something you know really nice out of it. And this consists of not just you know having data scientists on the team. But also, you know, UX designers, human-centered designers that can understand how to map those technologies um, to the to the uh, first three steps. Um, fifth, I think it's really critical um, that we've seen people also kind of skip this step and really put themselves in a, in a tough scenario. That you're making sure you're assessing the viability of of the features or the solution that you're putting out there. So making sure that you are projecting a, a return on investment that you're then measuring along the way as well. So if you're not breaking even or profitable on the product as a whole, it's going to be very difficult to serve your customers, you know, after your venture capital runs out or after your initial kind of R&D budget runs out within a larger institution. Um, so this really needs to be a focus upfront in designing the feature. And finally, making sure that there's the right buy-in from all of the stakeholders across the board. Of course, you know, the customer value proposition and, and trust of the customer is key. If you lose either of those things, then, then the feature is, is not really worthwhile. Um, but also we've seen, you know, having the right buy-in from um, the executive level, from the advisory board, from investment board um, is also really critical. Those can create hiccups along the way that are unexpected. Um, you can have all of the rest of this together, but if the CEO has you know a, a bone to pick with a certain type of AI, um, then it's going to be really difficult to put this out there. So these are all the kind of less technical considerations, but really big pitfalls if you don't take care of them. We've seen yeah, like people that pay attention to these six items or so um, succeed, and people that don't pay attention to any one or two of these um, have a much much more difficult time finding a path to success. Um, so after these things are in place, you can then begin to really deeply explore the data sources, um, taking a look at whether there's bias in the collection of those sources or in the coverage of those data, um, which can lead to potential discrimination in any model that's built off of that. Once you have the data in place um, and you feel confident about you know, the, the um, ability to build something off of this data, you can then begin to create the insights engine. And I think it's really critical here as you're creating a model or putting out your AI features um, or whatever you're doing with this data, it's really critical um, wherever you can to not treat this as a black box, to be able to have interpretable models. One great example we've seen is, is a portfolio company from the Catalyst Fund called Destakame, who does alternative credit scoring um, to some extent. And whether they approve you or not, they don't just say a binary yes or no, but they also include um, the idea of here are the steps you can take to increase your access to credit or to turn this no into a yes. And here are concrete activities that you can do to come along. And you can't have that kind of awesome uh, user experience with a black box solution that only says yes or no. Uh, and finally, when you deploy, that's not the end of your journey, right? I think this is maybe the most critical piece of all, um, that once you deploy, you need to be referring back to your success metrics that you've defined in the beginning, referring back to what your expected outcomes were and measuring all of these, while also monitoring for any unintended consequences that arise. Are you cutting out certain segments of your customer base? Is there a bug on one you know, flow of your chat bot? Um, is your model yeah, fair in the way that you expected it to be? And that can then in turn inform a new context and you can kind of start the flow again here. So that's kind of the high level view. Um, on the next slide, we dive a little bit more into the technical view. So this is a, a flow of, on the bottom, 
I, we could refer to this as, as an AI hierarchy of needs, which is a, a term that we didn't pen, but that we've built off of for this framework. Um, at the bottom of this pyramid, you have the collection of data. And as you move up, you're kind of working toward the deployment of a feature that's built off of that data. So you need I to be able it. to collect it in an appropriate way, validate it, yeah. um, move and yeah. store it in the appropriate way, explore the data to, to make sure that its um, fidelity no, 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 is high through the, dashboards and whatnot, out, yeah. um, be able to oh, aggregate yeah. that engineer yeah. features out of it, I'm not I'm create not um, machine learning models off of that and, and various tests to make sure that this model is doing what you yes, think yes. it should, and finally deploy it. Um, so that's the high level view. I think the exciting part might be to go quickly through uh, um, three okay. case studies that, that kind of I think the recording will go show off. how so, the different levels okay. of that okay. readiness can appear. Okay. Let me just exit um, so on the bottom right of these three examples, back, right? we see uh, a hierarchy with the areas that we worked in highlighted. Um, so smile identity is one example. Okay. This is a, a facial recognition okay. application that um, uses optical character recognition also to extract features from a driver's license and then can perform know your customer KYC um, flows with financial institutions and authorization flows or authentication flows um, with any institution. So they came out of the gate with a very impressive proof of concept. They had um, leveraged some of the, the modern facial recognition technology um, and were highly effective in US-based testing when we had met them. Um, they had a world-class team and uh, executive buy-in. So they had a, a phenomenal data science team that was ready to go with the technologies and the data that we talked about before. Um, they had buy-in from the executive level, which we also talked about earlier. These are critical enabling factors. Um, however, they were looking at taking the model and deploying it in a relatively new environment at the time, which was in okay. Kenya and in particular, um, so rural Kenya. And so there are two pieces of this that really we had to focus on, which are at the top layers of the pyramid. Um, were their models trained in a way that was going to be appropriate uh, no, for morning, the different uh, um, images that were coming into their system? And was this adapted in the deployment phase to the customers that they're serving? Not into any other and so we took a look at this and, and basically made some recommendations on how to optimize their model um, using some new deep learning technologies that were out there to transfer yeah, learn and, and bring in yet. more um, low lighting, um, different skin tones data set okay, from now, what they had been yeah, previously now, working with. Yeah, yeah, and also yeah, now, critically about, making sure that this mapped to the behaviors of um, folks in, in East seconds. Africa. I think it's um, so working. one major consideration was okay, when people take a selfie in rural Kenya, they okay. don't tend to smile, which was okay. the triggering mechanism for this. Sure, so okay. Okay. everything else could be in place, the buy-in, the technology, all of this, um, but making sure you're measuring what your customers are saying was critical for understanding that piece. So the second example plays kind of on the other end of the spectrum. Um, this is a company called Payagri that operates um, at the time in, in uh, South uh, India and focuses on farmers and connecting them up to various providers. Um, so they had this really, really solid network of agri-industry experts and funders and in financial institutions and other institutions. So they had the right value proposition, key stakeholder buy-in, kind of organizational structure and expertise to pull this off. They had really, along with that, this really awesome, exciting vision for streamlined farming via um, AI algorithms that would consume Internet of Things data. So basically, uh, there's a few words here, but the this, this long story short is they wanted to kind of make the farmer's plants smart, be able to kind of have those plants give themselves a voice and be able to say, hey, I haven't had my fertilizer yet. Hey, I, it's not rained for a few days. Please water me. Um, these sorts of things and have that come up through an AI based recommendation engine and out to the farmers so that their plants could actually tell them when they're ready. Um, and this was really like a phenomenal thing. They had all of the, uh, yeah, again, like the network together to be able to do this. They had the right technologies identified. Um, but actually at the base of this layer, their data infrastructure was not quite in, in the place where it needed to be to be able to scale and structure data in order to feed this algorithm. So we worked with them on their data schemas, um, the validation of the data coming in, the instrumentation of their products, um, feedback mechanisms for the farmers to, to feed back into that. So that's a, an example kind of at the base of the pyri pyramid. Um, and then in the third example, we worked kind of in the middle of this pyramid with a company called Optometrics. Now they're a, a micro merchants, uh, fast moving consumer goods intelligence company. They focus on um, what products are available at various small shops, um, mostly across East and West Africa. Um, 
so they had this really cool uh, setup where, again, they had kind of the right buy-in. Um, they had a viable model already operational, uh, but it was being manually done. So in chatbots, there's this concept called bot yourself, where basically like you have your customer service agents act as chatbots to get to gain expertise in preparing to build a chatbot. Um, in this case, this is kind of like the um, business analytics, like the physical retail business analytics version of botting yourself. They had a physical agents network that was operating in a viable model, um, manually counting the products and images that they were capturing as they went past these, um, these shops. Uh, so as a result of that network, they had um, a pretty robust merchant network that they were collecting information from and really highly um, high quality data. So our intervention here focused um, maybe more on the traditional point of, of AI, which is what technologies and um, AI features are available to kind of run with this. And so here we have uh, a screenshot of an object detection algorithm that was running that automates that process of counting products and images um, and really sets them up for efficient success. Um, and the second piece of this was maybe more on the deployment side, which is how can we take these insights and not only inform suppliers um, and maybe provide discounted prices to the merchants, but have another stream of information that comes off of these images that provides channels for alternative credit scoring. Um, so yeah, I, I think that those three examples really show a variety of how this framework has been useful. Um, and on the next slide, we have a couple of links and I'll turn it back over to Rasima to kind of take us home. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry to interrupt as well. Uh, just running a tight with the time, so I'm kind yeah. of a reminder out here for you. <laughs> Absolutely, and we're we're just about wrapping up. Thanks very much, um, both Santosh and Matt, for 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 really contextualizing and bringing this um, framework to life. Um, and and also some of the key things where you know their diversity in data sets is is key, and it can happen only once you've reached a certain level within your journey um, with the framework as well. Um, so just to wrap up, we would just say that this is a great time for focusing efforts on innovation, especially as it relates to building resilience in communities and catalyzing funding as donors and service providers are all encouraged to think beyond traditional approaches. However, please bear in mind, AI alone is not sufficient to solve many of the problems at hand. For example, in this COVID environment, there are systemic problems of containment, regulations, breaking supply chains, or the unavailability of structured processes to facilitate safe travel across cities. AI cannot solve these problems, but it can serve as a very useful tool to help create visibility to informed action by stakeholders. So, so just as a final note, uh, you need to think through the applications carefully, ask the right questions, um, identify the relevant use cases to start with, then determine your approach to the AI readiness framework that we have described. This framework is not just for fintech startups. We would also want to just note that it has been put into use by banks, MFIs, other corporates, and even regulators that are already that either already have a product or aspire to develop AI solutions. So please do check out the links on the page for more information if you're interested. And with that, we'll close our chat and open to questions. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, so quickly, you know, we have about uh, uh, 30 seconds. So for a question, if you have any, you can just drop in at the questions uh, section um, or uh, share them. Uh, so if any, if not, uh, then yes, you know, I think we are running as per the uh, time schedule as well as much as possible. Uh, so maybe you can unshare the screen, uh, uh, Rasima. Sure. OK. Here we are. Sure. That. Thank you so much. Um, so I would say I think we, we don't have a questions right now. I'm sure I think they might be contemplating the same and then you know putting up. So we make sure as a team that it reaches you and then you know offline you can actually address the same. So thank you so much you know for Azima you know for being here and Matt as well. Uh, so audience you know you can you know how to do it right you know. <laughs> so I don't have to say say it. thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone. So let's move on to the uh, next uh, session. We'll be back in a minute's time. So until then, thank you so much Razima for making time and Matt as well. So see you soon again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.